Hi, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Kyle Dine. I work with Food Allergy Canada, and I have multiple food allergies myself. Although a few years removed from university, today's topic is one that I am passionate about, as are the members of our panel who I look forward to introducing. Just before we start, a reminder that the contents of this presentation and related resources are for informational purposes only. People should talk to their doctor about any concerns or questions they may have regarding their own health or the health of their child. So today's session will include an overview on colleges and universities in relation to allergies. I'll discuss Food Allergy Canada's efforts through our upcoming reference guide. Then we'll get into what college and university life is really like from the perspective of students with food allergy. And then we'll open up the floor and the panel will answer your questions. So let's learn more about the college and university landscape in relation to food allergy. If you look at the Canadian prevalence data, and extrapolate it to the 2 million full and part-time students, we can approximate that 150,000 students are affected by food allergy at the roughly 225 universities and colleges across the country. That is a significant number. And what are the factors at play that create risk on campus? First, we'll look at students as it's important to understand that this is a group that are more prone to taking risks, such as not carrying their epinephrine auto injector or always avoiding their allergen. 60% tell their friends about their allergies, uh, with the majority believing that life is easier when others around them are educated about food allergies. When you combine risk-taking behaviors with the overall transition to a college campus with 10 times the student population, uh, the fact that you're starting to become fully independent for the first time, living in a residence, everything is truly a new situation to manage and navigate with food allergies. Plus, food can be present in multiple locations, such as in residence, off-campus housing, what to do in orientation week, food in common spaces, lecture halls, the cafeteria, campus restaurants, and also the library can all be places where food is present. With this big transition, it is crucial that students with food allergies remember to stick to those non-negotiables, uh, to remain vigilant, to carry their auto injectors at all times on campus, to have an emergency plan, also inform their roommates, their new friends about their food allergies, and communicate them with food services, uh, and ask them questions about their allergens, the ingredients, and the risk of cross-contamination in the kitchen. But we all know that college students are human and allergic reactions do unfortunately happen, which is why colleges and universities themselves need to acknowledge that they have students with severe allergies uh, and to accommodate them and implement formal policies that aim to reduce the risk of accidental exposure in their environments. And also it's really important that they realize that having stock epinephrine can help save lives on campus. And after all, uh, there's been a lot of progress in the establishment of policies for childcare settings, elementary schools, even high schools. It's, it's really an opportune time for college and universities to do more. And Food Allergy Canada is happy to be part of this process, and I'm going to discuss that in the next few slides. Food Allergy Canada has been working hard on the development of a reference guide for colleges and universities, which I'll outline in the next few slides. Our pilot project, the objective is to improve food allergy management in post-secondary settings. Uh, it will include a reference guide for managing food allergies, which I'll outline a little bit more, but also it will be, there will be research understanding the current environment uh, and reviewing key gaps as well. We're going to be doing that through online surveys with students and working with key research teams from both McMaster and Queen's University. The reference guide will be a free and comprehensive guide that will be bilingual, practical, and evidence-based. The focus on key areas of food service, student support services, and emergency response will be paramount within. We'll also be developing it with campus staff, including food service, parents, and students with food allergies, and allergists as well. And essentially, it will provide a very thorough template for institutions to develop their own policies that work on their own campuses. The anticipated outcomes of the reference guide 
will be that students' self-management practices improve. Uh, there will be clearly defined policies and they'll be easy to find in school communications. Uh, the support systems will include staff, residents, advisors, and peers. That trained food service staff will know how to accommodate students with food allergies. And emergency staff can have access and know how to use stock epinephrine. So overall, the anticipated results decreased emergency department visits and fatalities. This project has the involvement of many key stakeholders, including 15 universities and three colleges in nine provinces, four umbrella organizations, including Universities Canada, Colleges and Institutes Canada, Canadian College and University Food Service Association, and the Canadian Federation of Students, three major food service companies, parents, students with allergies. So it is quite a large team that we are working with to make it a very comprehensive resource guide. Our goal is by the year 2020, the majority of Canadian post-secondary institutions will have formal policies in place that create safer environments for students with food allergy. And we're looking forward to getting our pilot project rolled out uh, starting this fall. So now it is time to find out what university and college life is really like with the help of our really wonderful panel today. So I'd like to welcome our three panelists who will introduce themselves. Alyssa, take it away. Hi, so my name is Alyssa Burrows. I'm 19 years old. Um, I have a peanut allergy and I'm at McMaster University studying biology. My name is Dylan Brennan. I am 27 years old. I'm allergic to peanuts and tree nuts, and I did a four-year undergraduate degree in kinesiology and health science at York University, and then did a master's program at Western University in health and rehabilitation science. And I'm Emily Rose. I'm allergic to peanuts, and I go to McMaster for commerce, and I just finished my first year. All right, well, welcome to the three of you. We're really happy to have you join us. So uh, let's start off with first year university. Uh, what is it like compared to high school and especially with respect to allergies? How was that overall transition? So um, besides maybe the classes being harder and the school being a lot bigger, that's the main differences I saw from high school. Um, so in regards to my allergies, um, not everyone knew about my allergy like they may have in high school. Um, and if you live in residence, uh, I was eating out up to three times a day on campus, which is eating out a lot. And unfortunately, you can't store your EpiPen in, say, like a desk or like this, the high school's office. Um, so instead, you need to make sure you carry that, which I did this year in my first year. Yeah, so my first year, I had two first years, actually, but um, both were really positive. Obviously, the schools are a lot bigger and there's a lot more people around. Uh, I had a really fortunate positive roommate experience, which I think we'll get to a little bit later, so I'll tell you a little bit more about that then. Uh, but I also just treated university as one big restaurant, so I was comfortable in my abilities to manage my food allergies um, at restaurants, so I just kind of used the space at university the same way. So lecture halls, I chose my spots ap appropriately and uh, made sure that I always had safe snacks on me and uh, controlled it as if I was at a restaurant. Perspective. Yeah, and I found, I found that um, in high school I didn't really have to worry about my allergy in terms of the staff that was at the school, and in the cafeteria it was completely nut free. Whereas in university I had to inform people and often explain what it means to have an allergy, what cross contamination is, at least to the professors, and to the serving staff it wasn't necessarily a nut free facility, so I'd have to talk with them any time that I went somewhere that I wasn't completely sure of. So it was a lot more responsibility on me. Um, compared to my day-to-day -day in high school. And, you know, speaking of, of food service, I just I think of the average Canadian university campus size, and there there can be tens of thousands of students. Up, you know, I've, I've heard of some with fifty thousand, and uh, it's it's quite a job just to feed all of these students. So I would love for for you all to touch a little bit more about the food service side of things. Um, from a student perspective, was it easy to find information about what you can eat, what you can't eat, what would be available? 
And what was your experience like with the staff on a day-to-day -day basis? And were the safe meals easy to get? Okay. Information in terms of the university I went to this year was fairly easy to gain access to. Um, so I just did a little Google search of my university and the food services and sent an email. Um, there's an email sent out that said, if you have food allergies, please contact us. Um, so we had a meeting with the food staff before I even went to school. And they were really, really reassuring. And they built me an allergy profile, which included my symptoms and what to do in an emergency and where I kept my EpiPen. Um, in terms of my experience with the staff, um, sometimes I had a great experience, sometimes I didn't have as good of an experience. I found generally that the managers were the most knowledgeable, um, so I'd recommend requesting to speak to a manager if you're really unsure that the staff understands your allergy, especially the frontline food server. And yeah, and safe meals were fairly easy to get most of the time. Um, I always made sure of make a habit of asking um, to make sure that there's none of my allergen in my meals. There was also, fortunately, a peanut nut free. A facility on our campus, which is really great to go to as well. Yeah, from my experience, uh, the universities that I went to luckily had a lot of chain restaurants, so they were places that you could find the information really easily either on the website or by talking to the staff. The managers are always on pretty much on hand, so you can always talk to someone who will have an answer or find the, the information really easily. And I stayed in a residence that was an apartment style, so I had my own room shared with one other person in their single room, and we had a shared kitchen and bathroom. So I made most of my meals uh, and only went out on rare occasions, and luckily I had the chain restaurants that I felt safe eating at. And I did a similar thing to Alyssa. I, um, before the school year started, went and talked to the manager of um, all the food facilities at my university and he actually gave me a walkthrough of the cafeteria that I'd be going to every day and went through basically item by item and told me what was okay to eat, where all the food came from. Uh, he also introduced me to a lot of the people who worked there, the um, chefs who worked there and they were also very knowledgeable. I found they knew where all their food came from. A lot of it they made themselves um, and would know exactly what it had come in contact with. So I didn't have any problems and found the staff uh, knew what they were doing. That was wonderful to hear and it sounds like the three of you had really positive experiences and I think it really goes to show that the more advanced uh, advanced research you do in preparations, uh, the easier it will be because a lot of schools will, will have some procedures in place to help you transition to the whole dining experience there. Wonderful. Well, uh, so that's that's part of the whole transition in first year. But the other big part, I know we had a lot of questions already about, is residence life. And what is that like? Um, do you did you have a roommate? Uh, how would how did they handle your allergies? Dorm rooms uh, and dorm facilities. They sometimes have shared kitchens, sometimes not. How did you manage that? And and then. One interesting question, were there ever any food-based pranks that you experienced in residence? So we'd love to hear your thoughts on those. So in my first year, I did not have a roommate. Um, I medically requested a single room. So in terms of going about that, um, there's a form online that you could fill out if you needed a single room or a certain bedroom style for some reason. Um, so I had my allergist sign that, saying that she requested that I had a single room. In terms of my dorm did have a shared kitchen. I never really used the shared kitchen. I mainly ate on campus. If I were to use the shared kitchen, just because I don't know how often it was cleaned, I would bring my own pots, pans, utensils, and I would clean the spaces that I was using. Um, and I would not use the sponges left in the sink because you don't know what those have touched. And yeah. And in terms of food-based pranks, unfortunately, a food-based prank did occur in my residence, where peanut butter was spread on the doors, um, the door handles, and on some of the walls of the hallways. Um, my friends knew I had a peanut allergy, so they texted me in the middle of the night and they said, Alyssa, please be careful, please wash your hands and be aware not to like grab onto any of the door handles and things. And I was kind of upset by this issue, so I brought it up to my CAs, which stands for Community Advisor, who are students that live in the building as well, who take care of us, also known as Dons. And I also emailed my residence manager, who had the staff clean it up, and um, looked into the issue and I also made a Facebook post just to educate my peers about how food-based pranks are not something to be joking with because people do have very, very serious allergies. 
Oh, I'm really sorry to hear about that, Alyssa. And did you, I'm amazed that you did so many great things and, and stepped afterwards to uh, to try to make the situation better for other students. I'm curious, did um, do you think this was malicious at all, or was it just kids just doing a prank and not really thinking it through? I don't think it had any malicious intent at all. I think the individuals who just didn't think when they were doing it, some pranks happen in university residences. Usually they don't involve food. Um, usually it's just making a mess with maybe shaving cream or something else. So I don't think it had any malicious intent. I'm hoping my Facebook post went to help educate people that um, maybe we should stick to food safe pranks or no pranks at all in our residence buildings. Good point. Well, hopefully, you know, just for you shedding a light that, you know, these type of things do happen, hopefully will help other people at least uh, know that um, sometimes pranks do happen. Hopefully people will be smarter about those pranks. Stick to the shaving cream. Yeah, so my experience in uh, residence, in first year, I I'd heard at York University that you could request single rooms, same as what Alyssa was just saying. So I actually filled out a form for that particular residence. It was called Pond Road Residence, in case anyone's wondering. Um, and so I, I knew someone else who was going from my same school, who was going to York University and wanted to uh, find a roommate. So I, I knew he could help with the management of my allergies because he wouldn't uh, have peanuts or tree nuts around or he knew the right steps to take. So I requested to actually be with him and have a kitchen that at least I had a little bit of more control over. So the shared kitchen was literally just with one other person that I knew. And then for the rest of my university time, it was always living with a, a close friend who also knew all the steps to take in case of an emergency and how to practice safe food preparation, et cetera, et cetera. So I was really lucky in that sense. Food-based pranks, I never heard of any at York University or when I was at Western University. So I think I was very uh, fortunate in that sense. So I also chose not to have a roommate. I filled out the medical form from my doctor requesting to have a single room. But I did that more for my personality than my allergy. I like to have my own quiet time at the end of the day. I can't be around people 24-7. <laughs> but I did find that everybody on my floor who I interacted with was very understanding. Um, I felt comfortable being in rooms that had peanuts in them or Reese's Pieces or whatever. Uh, but I just asked that they didn't bring it into my room. Um, for the shared kitchen that was on my floor, I brought my own sponge um, on my own cups and utensils and everything, and I'd wash it in a little bin in the sink instead of putting it straight on the bottom of the sink where everybody else might be um, putting their plates and whatever. But I would say uh, whatever, do whatever you're comfortable with when you go to university. I know another girl on Yap did have a roommate, and she actually requested to have a roommate who understood allergies or was also had allergies. So she felt comfortable with the person she was living with. Whatever you want to do can be accommodated by the university, and they're happy to do so. Well, I'm really amazed of all the, the positive experiences that you've all had uh, with residents. So thank you for, for sharing some insight on what it, it is like. So, and, and typically, residence is a first year university college thing, and then the second year of many students will move off campus. And uh, that's the, the subject of our next topic. So how, how did you tell your new housemates, not just roommate, but housemates about your allergies? Did you set any ground rules? Was there any pushback? Did any issues arise? Uh, Alyssa, start us off. How did that all go? I guess you're kind of in the middle of it, are you not? Yeah, so I'm just moving from first year into second year. So um, next year I'm planning to, or I'm going to live off campus. So in terms of myself, my allergy is one of the first things I tell people about, whether it be where my EpiPen is or, hey, I have a peanut allergy. So all my roommates that I'm going to be living with this year knew ahead of time. Um, we're fortunate that we have two fridges. One will not contain peanut products and the other one will. Um, we're also going to have separate cupboards, which I know even some houses with non-food allergies have um, separate cupboards just so you can keep your own food and no one's stealing each other's food. Um, so mine will have all peanut-free products. I have also informed my roommates not to bake certain items at certain times. For example, like a peanut butter cookie before a midterm. Uh, because the smell kind of bothers me and a midterm is also a stressful time. So that might aggravate my feelings. And we're also going to buy some uh, stickers that say peanut free or peanut not free. 
um, just to have some things. And we're also going to be using our own utensils and washing them after we eat them. No issues have arised yet just because we haven't started living together, but I'm hoping if any issues do arise that we can um, resolve them as soon as possible. So I, since I went to school for six years, so four out of the six years I lived off campus and I chose my housemates and my roommates very carefully. It was pretty much uh, just a really small selection. I think at most I lived with three other people, but for the majority of my time I only stayed with one other person. And so I, I, I was very careful in how I selected roommates because I wanted people who understood the severity of my food allergy and how to actually prepare their food and to do so in a safe way. So my ground rules were pretty much the same as any other thing. Like I, I still lived my life as if everything was a restaurant. So I allowed peanut butter in the house, which a lot of people think is crazy, but I trusted the fact that I had taught my roommate well in the safe practice of preparing their peanut butter. So he always used toast and then he would spread his peanut butter over the one piece of toast with one knife and then put the jam on the other toast with a completely different utensil and then he would clean those utensils before I even got into the kitchen. So it was really contained and I felt really confident that everything was safe for me in the kitchen. Uh, so no issues arose. Luckily, I mean, I, I, six years of school, I never had any issues with my allergy in uh, my off-campus living. So I think I was very fortunate in that sense again. I have just finished first year, and next year I'm moving into a house with nine other girls. So lots of people to explain my allergy to. <laughs> So I am planning on making a Facebook post to um, all of my roommates explaining my allergy so they can think about any questions that they have. We're having a house meeting just before school starts. So there I'll be laying down the ground rules again about how I feel about peanut butter in the house. Um, I'd like them to make sure that they clean everything up, uh, use their own utensils, not just have it out. Um, just to try to make me feel more comfortable and feel safe. And also I'm planning to bring my own little bin again to wash my dishes in the sink, not use the dishwasher. And also I've been stockpiling my expired EpiPens, so I'm going to try to show them all how to use it so they feel comfortable with that and hopefully to get them more engaged. My parents and I rented a steam cleaner and steam cleaned the carpets up in my room just in case there was any peanut dust in there, besides the fact that they're very dirty and probably had never been cleaned anyways. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm sharing a fridge with uh, one other girl who I made friends with last year, and her sister actually used to be allergic to peanuts, so she's familiar with how to use an EpiPen and cross-contamination protocol. So I feel pretty confident going into next year and I'm looking forward to the adventure. Wow, with that many people in the house, uh, it might be an adventure, <laughs> but I feel like we need to have a follow-up webinar later on in the school year with, uh, with you, with Alyssa and Emily Rose, just to see how the, the transition to second year went. <laughs> um, but all really great information. The steam cleaner, I, I never would have even thought of that. Really inter great tip. And also I, I would like to touch on just the fact that with Dylan and um, with Alyssa, some of their strategies were um, you laid out the guidelines with your roommates and your housemates, which was fantastic, and you let them know what you were comfortable with and what procedures to follow to make sure that that's, that's still okay with you. And I love that, Alyssa, you, you allowed many things, but you had a rule with no peanut butter cookie cooking while you're around. So, you know, it's it's great that you can set these practical guidelines with, with the people you're living with and also set the boundaries too. So off-campus living, it's great to know it can be done. You People are, that you live with can be very understanding and helpful with that. Let's go back onto campus for the next topic, and that's talking about lecture halls. And really the big question here is, are students allowed to eat in lecture halls? And also curious, did you inform your professors? So students were allowed to eat in our lecture halls. Um, it was never normally an issue, but I just had one small issue where someone did have my allergen in terms of a sandwich um, in one of my 830 lectures. And I just decided to move seats. It wasn't a very crowded lecture, so that was easy to do. 
And I've had some people in libraries, for example, ask before eating their food if I had any allergies. And I, I, I would say, yes, I do, actually. I have a nut allergy. And they're like, okay, I won't eat my granola bar. And I'm like, okay, great. I really appreciate that. Um, in terms of informing my profs, I didn't inform my profs of my food allergy. Um, I don't see why you couldn't inform a prof or a TA if you'd like to. I don't think it's too much trouble to ask people from, to refrain from eating for 50 minutes if it's a small lecture hall and the small bothers you. In a larger lecture hall, it might be too difficult. But And I know if you are too nervous to, say, inform a prof and a TA and you'd like to, you could also send an email. Yeah, so lecture halls, it's, it's interesting. In first year, lecture halls are full of about anywhere up to 800 to 1,000 people in one room. So lecture halls were kind of crazy and chaotic on the best days, and I knew that you could eat in lecture halls. So I was stuck to the outside of rows in case I needed to uh, get away from someone eating certain food because I just didn't want to cause an issue. Uh, so that was my lecture hall experience. As you go on, so third and fourth year, you end up with classrooms that are maybe 30 people, 50 people at the most, so it's a lot easier to contain food in, in those situations, and by then you're pretty close with some of your peers, so they'd know about your allergy, and it's a lot easier to manage. In terms of the professor side, I was actually a TA or a teaching assistant for two years, so my whole master's time, and TAs are really approachable, and they're open to change a lot so they're kind of like the, the middle man between the professors and the students I worked really closely with the students and I mean I, I dealt with a lot of different issues that just came up so if you're ever in doubt pull a, a teaching assistant aside and have a word with them and they'll definitely pass it on to the professor or try to manage the food allergy with you as well yeah, so I had the same experience in lecture halls. There was a ton of people. I noticed anyways, we were pretty crammed in there. They couldn't really do a whole lot of eating. It was mostly just drinking water, coffee, whatever they want to bring in. But I didn't tell my professors or my TAs just because the situation never uh, came up until recently. Actually, I was in summer school, and on the last day, the professor decided to bring Reese's Pieces. Luckily, there was somebody else in the class allergic to peanuts, and he said something before I did. Um, but even then, the professor was fine with it. She just decided to wait until the end of the class to pass it out until after we had left. So that made me feel a lot more comfortable. But yeah, I didn't just do whatever you're comfortable with. Um, if somebody besides you is eating something that you're allergic to, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to just stop eating if you let them know. But I didn't find any problems in lecture halls. That's great to hear. And I'm sure uh, water, coffee, energy drinks perhaps might uh, be the most common things going around in classrooms. Um, but I, I love the tip about sitting on the ed end of the row. Uh, right on the edge. That's a great one. Thank you, Dylan. Also, it's just great to know that TAs, uh, teaching assistants, they're, they're a great liaison too of someone that you can inform about your food allergies and liaison between you and the prof as well. So interesting to have that perspective too. Um, so let's go from lecture halls to just general campus safety. Um, and we'll talk about that for a minute. And I'm really curious about our panel's recommendations and tips for just general campus safety, what it's like walking around campus, day or night, is food truly everywhere, and um, is it apparent what you'd do in an emergency? Do you know where you would go? So is food truly everywhere? I'd say it's in most places. Some library spaces are no food allowed because of equipment that might be there, such as computers. And also as a science student, fortunately, you're not allowed to bring food into lab. So that's a space that is totally food free. In terms of where I'd go in an emergency, our university kind of had it laid out really nicely and we were kind of all informed during our orientation or welcome week uh, what we should do in case of an emergency. So our school and as well as some other schools that I'm familiar with have an emergency response team, which is a group of students who are trained in first aid that will come to your aid. You can dial them from a campus phone or they have other methods to get in touch with them as well. And from my knowledge, they also carried um, epinephrine auto injectors and they'd call an ambulance and you'd get to one of the hospitals as soon as possible and I also knew what to do in an emergency from what my allergist had advised me to do and I've informed my friends of what to do in an emergency as well and also just like to point out that um, I was really fortunate at my university to, that we had a wellness center which was like a medical center it was a great resource and when I went and visited the doctor for another problem she 
asked me if I had any allergies, and I said yes. And she's like, oh, do you need any EpiPens? Are you all stocked up? Are they all up to date? So I was glad that she was really um, vigilant as well and aware of allergies. So on campus, they have uh, blue lights. I mean, this is at York University, at least. They had blue lights with uh, an emergency phone, and those phone lines went directly to security on campus, and then the security would respond immediately by sending someone out to those phones. And so these are scattered. There's maybe 15 or 20 throughout campus, and they're always within eyesight. So pretty much every, at any point where you are, you can pretty much see a blue phone. So worst case scenario, if you're on campus, you could get to one of these phones and get security to help you immediately. Otherwise, you can treat campus just like you would if you were at a mall or something. You'd want to call 911, use your auto uh, epinephrine auto injector, uh, and then take the normal emergency steps that you would as if you were off campus. And there's also, at, at some schools, they have uh, escort service where at the end of the night, if you want someone to walk you to your residence or back to your car, you can call this group and they'll send two people out to basically walk with you from point A to point B and it's, it's usually a free service. So if you're really questioning your safety or uh, I guess your well-being at any given point in time, you can always have two people with you just to walk with uh, from point A to point B. Yeah, I found that food was basically everywhere, even in the buildings that weren't food buildings, like the lecture hall buildings. They would have like small little cafe things. But that's also good because that means that there's food staff everywhere. So if you did have a problem, you could always go up and talk to them and they'd be able to get in contact with security or 911. And also, um, as mentioned before, there was the emergency polls everywhere you go. And I actually used that walking service that at McMaster. I would get home pretty late from my curling practices, probably about midnight, and I had to park really far away from the school. So I would call up the walk service and two people would show up and take me back to my residence. So just in general, that made me feel a lot more comfortable for walking around at night. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's great that campuses provide that. I know on mine there was, um, it was the same thing, they called it uh, foot patrol, and you could just call them up and they could uh, escort you to where you needed to go. But it's also great to, just to know that there's these blue phones that are around campus that you can go to. So. Um, it's a great tip for, for prospective students and parents to remember that that is a place where you can reach out, get help right away. And speaking of parents, we're going to go on to one more panel discussion topic before we open it up to general Q&A. And I'm sure there are some college and university students or high school students listening to this, but I have a hunch that there might be some parents as well scouting out some of this information, which is wonderful. So. What would be your tips for parents? What would you tell a parent who might be worried about the college university experience? What advice would you give about preparing their son or daughter for this new independent uh, transition? Okay, so some tips I would give to um, a worried parent um, would be uh, that you taught your son or daughter um, very well on how to be a self-advocate from a very young age and how to be responsible because they've had to be responsible for their food allergies throughout elementary school and high school and wherever else they might be in the world. And also one thing I'd like to say is that people really, really do care about your child, both the university and their new peers. I know sometimes maybe their high school may have painted the picture that universities don't care about you, but they do. Um, I had a great easy time talking with TAs or professors or my new friends about different issues. What advice would I give to help prepare their child for university or college? Help them build their allergy profile if your school has one. Um, help them get in contact with the right people. I know especially towards the end of June it's a busy time if you're both finishing up high school exams and heading off to university and you're getting all these university emails. But throughout the summer, trying to get in contact with the right people so that you can ensure that they're all set up in September um, for their new fresh start. It's always a great idea um, to talk, reach out to upper years when needed. For myself, I found some people during Welcome Week who are in upper years um, who had allergies because they had it painted on what we call a rep suit, um, which people wear during Welcome Week and they had like a peanut free sign or a milk free sign painted on their rep suit so I felt free to talk to them. Um, some other general advice I'd say is to call your mom and dad. Tell them to call you every once in a while because you guys care about them. 
and okay. also for them to have as much fun at university as possible because it's a really, really fun experience. Yeah, to build off that, I'd say trust that your child uh, is fully capable of managing their food allergy on their own. And I'd say uh, having conversations with your their son or daughter about their comfort level of going off to university and, and managing their allergy on their own, whether they're commuting to school or they're going across the world to school, having that soundboard can help them or guide them towards independence if they're not already there or you can help just by letting them rant about what they're worried about and you can gather information and help them along the way but acting as a soundboard to help build comfort is always a nice thing to do. Yeah so I used my parents as kind of like a sounding board. I would go through all these steps and try to be as independent as I possibly could but along the way I would always check with my parents just to make sure I checked all the boxes, did everything right, wasn't missing anything, see if they had any new ideas or didn't think that the school was being thorough enough in the information that they were giving me. So that made me and my parents feel a lot more comfortable because my parents knew what was going on along the way and I felt like I wasn't missing anything but still felt that I was being independent. So I would suggest that your son or daughter do everything themselves in terms of contacting the university so they're familiar with who they're talking to, but as well keep you informed as to what they're doing along the way so that they don't miss any important steps because it's a busy time. I remember I was finishing exams, getting all these emails from the university, trying to set up my schedule, and trying to deal with my allergy all at the same time. All excellent tips for parents, and I love that uh, you all kind of mentioned how your parents really prepared you well uh, in advance for college and for university, and that parents just need to remember that, that you've done a lot along the way to help get them to this point, and not to just let them go completely still. It, it seems like it, you appreciated their help through the process of still finding, uh, giving guidance on what to check into with the university, so it just sounds like a, a nice general uh, transitioning of, of responsibility of allergies and independence, which uh, it sounds like went really smoothly and you've, your parents have all done an incredible job of that. So with that being said, we uh, are going to now just open it up to questions. So for everybody who's on the call today, you can submit any questions you'd like. We'll get to as many as we can. So uh, I'm going to start off just with a few submitted questions that we received before the webinar as people started registering. And the first one I wanted to bring up, so I'm not sure if you've, if you've heard about fraternities or sororities, but um, I'm, we know that no one has lived in a fraternity or sorority, but knowing that environment, how do you think that would uh, go with a food allergy? And Dylan, you might have a little bit more experiences from all the years you were at, at university. Do you, do you know much about fraternities, sororities? What are they like in general? I actually, I, I mean, I never even went to a, a house which was a fraternity. But from what I, I guess from my general experience, let's say, when you go to a party or go to a friend's house who has I mean, I went to a house that had 11 other roommates, so obviously there's a lot going on in that house at any given point in time. But I just manage my allergy the same way, so I'd wash my hands before I eat anything. Um, if I'm drinking, then it's a ultimate safety where I have to know where my drinks are, uh, never let that drink that I'm actually currently drinking out of my sight, just so I know that someone won't accidentally take a sip and then go, oh, actually, that's not my drink, and put it back down while I'm looking away. So I always kept my drink in my hand, and if I was eating, I would wash my hands beforehand, make sure that I talked to whoever was preparing food, uh, and then just being really detail-oriented in that sense and not taking any unneeded risks in any sense. So if I was at a party, I, I just wouldn't take the risks of drinking something new or eating something new because I was hungry or thirsty, I would just avoid it and wait until I get home to eat or drink something that I think is safe for me. Great points. And um, I think, you know, with Emily Rose moving into a house with, I think it was six other girls, 
um, that's getting close to that uh, type of almost like a sorority house. But some of the things she outlined that she'll be doing uh, with informing everybody, laying out some of the ground rules and what she's okay with, and I think uh, you know those are just great strategies overall to have, no matter where you're moving into. Speaking of alcohol, I knew this question was going to pop up. How do you suggest parents handle advising their their child about alcohol and food allergies? They're worried about drinking and eating specifically. So, any advice about that on campus? I know there's it's sometimes it goes hand in hand with the college experience. So, what advice would you give to a parent trying to tell instill the, the best practices in their child? So, I'd probably recommend knowing uh, what. Um, say alcohols your child can or cannot consume. I know some do have the cross contaminations of whether it be wheat or nuts or peanuts. Um, so knowing ahead of time what they can and cannot drink and maybe bringing their own drinks with them. Also to be weary of like open at parties sometimes there's open bowls of chips and stuff and also maybe an open container of nuts. So being weary that there could be cross contamination going on. And I really like Dylan's point that he highlighted to make sure that you know where your drink is at all times. And I think that is something that probably started at even elementary school parties when they're birthday parties. Um, and college and university parties generally have a lot of people, so just being very careful of um, and handling it like you would at a restaurant and just being very vigilant. And also maybe informing your friends that you're going out with um, of your food allergy and also making sure that you have your EpiPen on hand. Yeah, so just keeping those safe practices at hand, so making sure that the cup that you drink out of is clean, making sure that you don't play games that involve a cup that gets flipped over onto a table that's dirty because you don't actually know what was on that table before you started playing the game and now all of a sudden you're drinking out of a cup that touched it. I know that I almost avoided games exclusively if I noticed that the cups weren't filled with water because a lot of times you can play a lot, a lot of these drinking games with just water in a cup and then you drink out of your bottle or your can separately. And that's, I mean, that's just, in my sense, that's just general germ, germaphobe practice, good, safe practicing. But yeah. it also goes really well with allergies. If you can convince the crowd to play with, like, beer pong with water cups, it goes a long way because then you can actually enjoy yourself and play in the games that everyone else is too. The, you know, this is all really great information, and um, we, we think so much about cross-contamination co cross with food and plates and forks and utensils, but uh, just to shine a light on, on bottles and cans and drinking, uh, it's really another level of, of being aware of your surroundings. So overall, it sounds like that is a really good thing to be preparing your child for before they go to, to university, to letting them know that there are drinking games, that there are alcohols that might not be safe for you. Uh, so all really, really great points, and thank you for, for sharing that. Another question came in about Frosh Week, or Orientation Week, as it's commonly called now, um, where there's day trips, there's sometimes there's parties, res events, where there's food. Um, maybe you could highlight what your Orientation Week was like, and how much food is involved, uh, was there any risky situations? Um, Emily Rose, I'm curious how it was for you, since you're a year removed from, from your Frosh week. Yeah, so in my welcome week, they started planning it well before the actual event. So they actually gave me a contact number uh, saying if you had any dietary restrictions to please call this person, so I did. And she contacted the kitchen for me and they told me what they usually say at big events like this that is not a peanut free kitchen they'll try, try their best <laughs> um, but to talk to the food staff when you got there so the way it was set up was um, basically the whole day was scheduled for us and we would all go to meals together and it was buffet style just at any sort of conference that you would go to so um, just at any buffet that I would go to I talked to the staff that was there they'd go check with the kitchen tell me what was okay to eat and I didn't really have any problems with that. It's the same staff that would be cooking throughout the year. They're just cooking different food. So they were just as knowledgeable as I found later on. And I found it to be a pretty good introduction to um, how McMaster handles their food policies. My welcome week was the same as Emily Rose's welcome week because we attend the same school. Um, but 
another like tip is that we're really like it's a really really busy time. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, there's day trips and stuff as well. So making sure that if you are going off camp, well, well, anywhere on campus, you're bringing your like epinephrine auto injector. Informing these like brand new people you met, like, hey, I have a food allergy, and also just making sure to bring your own water and safe snacks in case there isn't something that you can eat as well. Yeah, and it's been nine years since my frost week, so. When I put it in that perspective, that is, is a very long time ago. <laughs> but from what I remember about my frosh, it, it's really neat in the sense that you can go to as much or as little as you want. No one's saying you have to go to all these events and be up from 7 a.m. till midnight. You can do as much or as little as you want, and you can carry a backpack with you or a bag, and no one's going to look at you any different because you're all just having a good time and going from point A to point B and, and having fun in these events. So you can pack your safe snacks. You can tell the frosh leaders about your allergies, and they're literally responsible for your well-being. All great uh, inf info that you've shared, and you know it's it's really that that one first impression that you're you're giving off to people, and a lot of new friends are made during that very first week, and. It's a really great time to let them know about your food allergies just so it's out there, it's in the open, they know about it right away. So a great time to take advantage of that opportunity. A follow-up question regarding drinking, and I think this is a really important one uh, that we address as well, not just knowing what's uh, in your alcohol, but just letting your guard down because you're drinking. Would you have any tips on that about how to stay in control? Is there something parents should be talking to their kids about before they get to the drinking age? So the first party that I went to, I talked to my parents about it, and they made sure that I brought my own food and um, that I was going with people that knew about my allergy. And I was very careful about what I drank. I also brought my own drinks um, and tried to stick with that, especially because it was my first real party that I wanted to feel as safe as possible. But mostly I would handle it just like the past parties that you've gone to, just to be extra careful. Making sure that you know um, what food is there, if there is something with your allergen in it, to consider not eating anything for the rest of the night. Um, just because of cross-contamination, things on people's hands. I know that I've done that before. Um, this was a university party, but I went to a New Year's Eve party, and it was a block party, so people were going in and out of everybody's houses. And I went into this one house, and this lady had bowls of peanuts in basically every single room of her house. <laughs> and I was so scared. Um, but yeah, for the rest of that party, I didn't eat anything because I wasn't sure. Uh, where everybody's hands have been. So basically, I would say just to follow the rules that you've always followed, just be extra cautious if you're in a dangerous situation. I also know from like the parties that I've attended at uh, university so far, and no one really pressures you um, to consume or to eat anything that you're not comfortable with or to consume um, more alcohol than you're comfortable with. And people are generally, my experience, have actually been really, really responsible in all aspects of going to a party. Um, so I think there's also that, that people are just really responsible and really care about each other and want to have a good time without being dangerous. I have a story um, where I actually did let my guard down and I was at a club with a, a group of friends that I didn't necessarily know really well. So in that sense, you almost don't want to point out every detail about your life. So in, in that situation, I didn't tell many people about my allergy. And then I had a, a few drinks. And along the way, a cute girl came up to me and told me to try this drink. And I thought, in the moment, I thought, oh, OK, absolutely. She says it's really good. I'll give it a shot. And so right when I was, bef like, right as I put the cup up to my lip, the aha moment went, uh-oh wait a minute, you actually don't know what's in this drink. And I stopped and I pulled it away and I said, wait, what's in this thing? And it turns out that amaretto was the main base in the drink. And being allergic to tree nuts, I kind of had a little freak out that I almost took a sip of this amaretto just because a cute girl had offered me this drink that she said was really good. So I think keeping a cool head in any situation and doing that 
on a regular basis helps to instill confidence even when you're drinking and having to keep that cool head when you're drinking is tough but it's absolutely essential to do it in every setting and you know just even break it down what cool having a cool head in these all, all situations really means you know I think it's important that you're grounded in the knowledge that your parents have provided you and that you've talked about these situations in advance because you know, no one really prepares on, on that specific situation of someone just offering them a drink. But I think with all of this information that's being shared tonight, it's it's really good for parents to start thinking of these things and asking their, their kids, what would you do in a situation where someone just shared a drink with you or, or did this or did something you're not comfortable with in a college environment? Because I think the more that you talk about it uh, before college or university, the more it's just ingrained in them. So um, the, when the day comes that alcohol is thrown into the mix, there's a very solid foundation uh, in your child where they know what's right, they know what's wrong, they can identify risk factors uh, immediately. And um, Dylan, it sounds like right in the, in the nick of time that, that kicked in for you, uh, keeping your cool head. So um, thank you for sharing that uh, personal story. We've got some Questions coming in um, about dating and kissing, which is all fantastic, and we're running very short on time, so um, I think that would be a fantastic topic for another webinar, just to do uh, social and dating and all of that, because it's really a separate issue that I know we could give a lot more information on. But I think just to wrap up, we'll do one last question. What what would you do differently? Would there be a, any questions you wish you asked? Would your allergies play more of a role in looking for a school than it did a couple of years ago when you were starting to apply? Um, so in terms of choosing a university, um, I didn't really let my allergies play too, too much of a role in choosing a university. I kind of was like, okay, I'll apply to university, pick one, and then figure it out from there. Um, I'm really happy that I got in contact with the schools beforehand and kind of organized a profile um, to manage my allergies and what food was safe and what was not safe and also a residence plan. Um, in terms of choosing a college and what questions you should maybe ask on a tour, I know I think on one tour I asked a question oh, like what is the food like here? That was just the general question I'd ask at the tours and one of the students did have a, a food allergy themselves and they gave me all their personal tips and advice and explained what living was like with a food allergy at that campus. Um, I know on one campus tour there's also a um, chef who was there f during the food service tour and um, we got to ask him about different allergy managements and stuff like that and they seem to have no problem with accommodating students with allergies. Um, so I'd say just maybe ask on a tour or see if you can find their policy online or get in contact with someone whether before you choose or after you choose it um, and I think you'll be good. Yeah, I think if I could do something different, when I originally applied to my undergrad degrees, uh, I actually just picked schools that I thought looked good on paper. I didn't really do much research other than that, so I never attend, attended the university fairs or the orientations just to give people a better idea when they're applying, and I think those are really cool opportunities where you get a tour of the campus, you get to see firsthand what's going on on those uh, on those campuses and you get to ask questions with people who are there and you're usually with your parent and you get to ask those questions ahead of time so I, I chose York specifically because I could go home if I wanted to but I was also far enough away from home I'm from Aurora so I was far enough away that I didn't feel like I was living at home still uh, and that was a big decision for me because it provided me with a little bit of comfort when I strayed off to Western, it was because I felt a lot more confident in my abilities and I wanted to live farther away from home at, at a university that had a really good reputation. I also wouldn't do anything differently. I um, didn't choose my school based on my allergy. I didn't even look into it, I don't think, before I decided which schools to apply for. I just looked at which schools had the best programs and grades and everything like that. Um, as with any decision that I've made up to this point, I do what I would like to do and then figure out how I'm going to accommodate my peanut allergy so that I'm safe. Um, I feel that with university you just have so many options that you don't have to 
choose a university based on your allergy if you don't feel that that's necessary because even if they don't have a good enough meal plan you can always make your own food you can choose to live off campus in first year and then um, completely make all your own meals you can choose to live close to home so then you can go home and pick up your meals from home there's just so many options and I feel that I did a pretty good job this year and didn't have any issues <laughs> Well, it sounds like you all have uh, followed great steps in making sure that your uh, your, your university life is safe, and um, I, I'm really impressed with all of the, the practical tips that you all provided t today. So I want to personally thank you all for, for sharing such helpful information and also some personal information and stories as well, because it all really helps uh, people listening to this be aware of what campus like life is like and to prepare accordingly. So I want to just move on and thank our supporters for t this webinar, uh, Pfizer, Sean Delaney Memorial Golf Classic, the Walter and Maria Schroeder Foundation, and also the Peanut Bureau of Canada. And lastly, we hope that you've enjoyed today's presentation and uh, really encourage you to check out foodallergycanada.ca and all of our other resources. Thank you very much for listening and have a great day.